I will tell you quickly some of the takeaways for me of this work so far this semester. And I think these takeaways might help frame our talk today. So the one, one takeaway is that Turnitin and software detection for, AI, for academic integrity are not going to work for much longer in terms of um, academic integrity for students. We're going to need to teach, not just police integrity in this new world. And I think that will kind of, uh, when we get to our speaker here in a second, that will uh, become relevant. The second takeaway that I want to just quickly share is that students are really pushing us to consider integrating AI learning into our courses, uh, helping them develop critical AI perspectives and to learn to use the tools ethically. One student on our panel from a week or so ago, and I'm slightly paraphrasing him here, said that, quote, other elite schools are actually buying this technology for their students because they know it's important in today's workforce. We need to, he said, we need to do the same at SF State because we're going to be left behind. So that gave me something to think about for sure. Um, I think there's a lot to grapple with here. There's going to be more uh, CETL and AT events in the spring, so stay tuned. Uh, but in the meantime, thinking about those two takeaways, I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker today, um, Carlos Montemayor, a professor of philosophy here at San Francisco State. He has just published a book um, called The Prospect of Humanitarian Artificial Intelligence, which is on my winter break reading list. It looks fantastic. He works in the areas of diversity, consciousness, cognitive science. You can find some of his talks on YouTube. I met Carlos for the first time last year at an LCA webinar on AI where we were panelists. And so it's a real pleasure to work with him again in this webinar. His talk today is titled AI Ethics in Higher Education. I'm gonna hand things over to him. At the end of the talk, there will be time for Q&A. Um, I ask you to put your questions in the Q&A function on your webinar. We will be moderating it as we go. Um, Andrew Roderick is here and can answer general questions in the Q&A if those come up. Um, and then we will uh, curate the questions and um, have a discussion at the end of the session. So as we go, please feel free to use the Q&A for questions. Um, yeah, okay, great. Um, all right, Carlos, I think we're ready. Great, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, I, I should say that uh, a lot of what I'm gonna say is in collaboration with Jennifer and also with Andrew. And uh, that, uh, so I will share my screen. Uh, the first thing I want to say about this is that uh, the problem of automation is uh, different from the problem of AI. I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the technologies we have now and uh, how uh, there's a danger of automation, but how the, the main danger is uh, eroding trust uh, in education uh, between professors and students. And I think that is a problem that is particular to the ethics of AI in higher education. I'll start with uh, just general considerations of technology and how to regulate AI, given that there's uh, a lot of hype, but also uh, a lot of mistrust and it's understandable because uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful kind of automation and uh, probably uh, completely unprecedented. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of of its implications for labor and for replacing uh, many uh, aspects of how we live, and and, uh, and, and I mean the, the human replacing the human component in many of our interfaces and interactions, but in education in particular, the risk is to displace universities as centers of uh, knowledge production and knowledge generation. I think this is a probably one of the most important risks that we're facing in higher education. I briefly uh, talk about this in, in, in this book that Jennifer mentioned in her general introduction. Uh, it's, it's open access if you want to get the PDF. But uh, if we stop becoming relevant as the main generators of knowledge and, and, and training to, for students to know the world, and we get replaced by these technologies and, uh, and and the companies that produce it because of, because we don't understand how to we we don't become creative in how to use them and become out, outdated in in our pedagogy. Then I think that's that's part of this risk of uh, not becoming irrelevant as centers of learning and knowledge production. And I think that would be the a catastrophe for universities. Um, so, uh, and, and public universities uh, with not a lot of resources like ours are in particular 
are, are even more vulnerable to this risk. But I think it's a general risk. So um, generative AI is this uh, incredibly powerful uh, kind of automation. And as I said, the, the really, uh, you know, the holy grail of this uh, technology is to create a completely autonomous machines, completely autonomous intelligent machines. We're not quite there yet, but uh, we're, we're on an incredibly accelerating, accelerated path towards more and more uh, intelligent and, 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 and fast uh, machines that are outperforming humans in many, in many tasks and many tests. And uh, we have had, we've, we've struggled uh, regulating other technologies that move very quickly, some of them fueled by, by war and by, by, uh, by, by the military, like nuclear energy. Uh, some of some of them we uh, regulate under under uh, strict liability rules. For example, the food industry, if they poison the population or they they create risks uh, uh, with respect to the products that they sell, it doesn't matter which intentions they have or how diligent they were. They need to they need to uh, compensate for the harm they produce. Um, we haven't been very able very good at, at regulating uh, automation. Uh, and then the displacement of workers, for example, the, the uh, uh, conductors, but also taxis, taxi drivers. And we have not been very good at protecting workers, for example, regulating Uber. But Uber is obviously regulated under a, a set of uh, industries that, that don't create the kind of risk that uh, generative AI creates. And of course, the big question is what's going to be the 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 model here, right? So do we want to uh, regulate AI uh, the way we regulate the food industry or nuclear energy through an international uh, framework? Uh, Kamala Harris uh, gave a speech very recently at a, at a forum, a very important international forum, uh, pushing very hard for the idea that it should be an international framework similar to the nuclear energy regulation framework. And also regulated through human rights, which is something I, I also emphasize in this uh, thing that I published recently. Um, so this is a, a, a very disruptive technology. Everyone understands it. No one knows how to regulate it. No one knows how to enforce legislation that exists to protect the privacy of consumers. So it's a it's disruptive. It's moving very quickly. We're kind of sleepwalking into this, and, and there's also all sorts of risk. And I don't want to keep scaremongering here, but uh, the, the idea is this is a problem of regulation. It's a legal, uh, domestic and international issue, and the, the industry is moving much faster than we are reacting. So, uh, so that's a problem. But of course, there's a specific problems that have to do with ethics uh, or how to live a good life and empower everyone as, as much as possible to have a dignified and, and, and flourish uh, and, and a life that they were in which they can flourish uh, so um, there's general issues concerning transparency manipulation and trust uh, automa uh, automation of the kind that we have empowered through artificial intelligence has been used to uh, manipulate uh, uh, and predict the behavior of the public uh, capture attention in ways that are uh, also part of this predictive coding that allows companies to uh, keep us consuming their information production. Uh, and of course, this has already eroded the public sphere and, and, and the, the way we trust. Uh, we saw that uh, we trust information. We saw that with the basic, basically the replacement of the, of the traditional media sources with uh, social media, which created a lot of disruption, political and uh, just general uh, lack of trust, uh, polarizing the public in ways that are uh, that that are very concerning. Uh, there's also, of course, the issue of deep fakes and uh, information that is false and manipulative, uh, and all these are very uh, big threats to communication in terms of education, eroding trust among teachers and students. Uh, we've become ultra focused on plagiarism, and as Jennifer says, uh, uh, something really important is that uh, we're policing students for the use of a technology that is not going to go away. Any, I mean, it's just there's no point to prevent them from using it. They're not going to stop using it. And on the contrary, 
we should use it in a way that benefits our students. Uh, and to the extent that we can generate uh, strategies to use this technology in a way that we recreate and regenerate trust in, in, in public institutions like ours and, and just trust and engagement in the classroom by empowering them to use the te this technology in, in interesting and, and educationally beneficial ways. So needless to say, uh, there's a lot of hype. Every day there's something about hype or super crazy, you know, either, you know, these things are going to be conscious in five years, which I find really dangerous people saying that, but that's there. Uh, a lot of hype about how this is going to replace uh, most things that we care about. But within education, what we really should focus on is we already are reacting in a way that is responsive to the hype. And what we need to be responding to is our students' needs rather than the hype. Uh, so we're not going to lose our job if we develop trust with our students and stop policing them. That's, that's I think, what, what, what one of the messages that I want to take from what uh, Jennifer, where Jennifer started us off. Um, and one thing that I discussed with Jennifer that is related to this idea and the work that she's been doing is that uh, this, this overreaction, this like, oh, we need to police our students and prevent them from using this awful thing. And, and you know, this, they're just going to become even more lazy and more manipulative or whatever the hype is coming, wherever the hype is coming from. Well, that, that's preventing us from really focusing on the ethical issues, which is we need to cooperate with our students. So this, this technology is as much a threat to what we do to, uh, to, uh, as it is to them and what they, uh, you know, their future as, uh, you know, part of the working force, but also uh, part of uh, academia. So uh, we need to collaborate and cooperate with them. Uh, we're at the very beginning of this conversation. This technology has uh, accelerated in the past uh, five years in ways that no one predicted. Even the developers of the technology uh, couldn't possibly predict just the, 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 the fast pace at which uh, this technology is outperforming human performance, but so we need to start this conversation now, before the before we lose track of what is important, right? Which is create trust and cooperation rather than uh, invent forms of preventing them from using the the, the technology or uh, focus all our attention on policing them. Um, so. I mean, and, and again, one, one thing that is interesting is that universities are, on the one hand, as I said, like universities that are really big with a lot of resources, they actually conceive of themselves as part of like the efforts to bolster this technology and, and use it in, in, in ways that are innovative and so on. Uh, we are in a different situation. So we should be focused on using the technology in ways that are bene beneficial to our to our students, to our own research, uh, have more discussions about how to use it. Uh, and most mostly, one thing that affects everyone, like universities with a lot of resources and, and, and universities that are, that, that are much smaller, is that universities have a, an opportunity as generators of knowledge, as generators of training and, and, and trust in, you know, uh, through the academy, through the professors that that you know, like students are trusting them with their with their life, their education, we have an opportunity to reframe also the debate about how to trust AI, given the 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 current crisis of trust in the public sphere. So, universities still maintain a status of trust among the public, and. Uh, we have an opportunity to be part of this larger conversation. I don't think that's a priority, but it is It is an opportunity that, that we have. And uh, something I've discussed with uh, Andrew, but also with Jennifer and other colleagues, is that because of the nature of our institution and the CSU, but also the fact that we are located where we're located, where the technology is being produced, uh, we are in a particularly interesting situation for becoming part of this larger conversation about public trust, uh, the public sphere and education in general, right? So because uh, if something empowers 
people. And if something makes the life of people more dignified, it's education. So clearly a technology that is threatening trust in education is a technology that we need to uh, understand better, see that it's not the awful threat that most people think it is, and and that the problem is not if it becomes conscious or it destroys the world. The problem is how to re- think our sources of trust in, in the classroom, at universities, and then publicly, the university as, the, as, as, as one of the faces of the knowledge generation that people need in the context of this uh, machinery that is producing uh, knowledge at a very rapid pace. So, so again, I think, I think of this as an opportunity, and, and this is part of a larger conversation I think that we should be having. But the most urgent one is the one that uh, Jennifer already referred to, which is that we are not reacting in a in a in a in a way that is conducive to trust, right? So so we need to listen to our students to 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 think about their needs, to think about how we interact with this larger world in which we live in, and the companies that 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 literally are uh, on the uh, in the same city where. <laughs> Where we operate and universities is, is serving this population, so uh, we, we have a lot to talk about, and, and, and literally we can't waste any time <laughs> because um, this is happening very quickly, and our students are in desperate need to use this technology in a way that uh, facilitates uh, a, a good class environment, but also that empowers their 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 learning. Um, so what should be your focus? I mean, I'm taking a lot of these, uh, again, from, from uh, ideas that uh, uh, I discussed with Andrew, but also with Jennifer. Um, so AI detection in the classroom uh, presents, of course, issues of how, e how efficacious it is, how, how uh, really reliable it is. As, as Jennifer already said, it's not really reliable. And the cost is huge, right? Accusing a student of plagiarism is a very serious accusation. And plagiarism through the use of technology is completely different from some from a student just uh, copy pasting something. This is uh, a, a very different kind of technology. It's not just the the standard way of plagiarizing. This is another thing we need to 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 understand. Our students are not just uh, trying to uh, to um, uh, manipulate us or or trick us into thinking that they're really learning. They're exploring this technology because this technology, is creative, you know, in ways that is interesting to everyone, and also it's interesting to them. So they are curious, and they they need to be able to use it, right? So we need to discuss how should we be monitoring their use of this technology without, with really efficacious ways of doing it, promoting equity, right? Uh, not preventing students that 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 are already. Uh, in a disadvantage, given you know, you know the their background or or uh, uh, sort of the conditions of like the asymmetries that exist in society, uh, we need to help them become more empowered through the use of this technology. And again, we need to create an atmosphere of trust more than than policing or uh, an atmosphere of uh, um, where the student is perceived as uh, uh, someone who's cheating by using the technology. Um, so how are we going to do this? I mean, th I, I think this should be our, our most immediate focus. Uh, we need to, uh, I mean, a, a lot of people have been discussing having uh, uh, assignments where the student is asked to use the technology and then evaluate whether the technology is doing a good job or hallucinating or comparing uh, uh, an original source with something that is produced by AI to see very important differences, right? Like most of the time the AI sounds okay, right? But it's very monotonic and very sort of like, monot not monotonic, but monotonous and like it's, it's well-written, but it, it lacks depth or it lacks uh, the, the kind of thing that, that is needed for a deeper understanding of a problem. So we need our students to see these things, right? And for that, we need to use, to let them use the technology in a more creative way. So I'm not suggesting that's the only model, but I mean, again, that's what is so valuable about these webinars and these conversations that 
uh, we need to refocus our attention that was initially placed on like uh, watermarking and, and policing to like trying to be more creative. And as the technology moves forward and it becomes more powerful, how we're going to adapt to to that. Um, so uh, so again, there are, there are here issues of uh, equity, uh, how uh, efficacious our policies are going to be. Uh, how are we going to create trust and increase trust as, as, as a sort of goal in our classrooms and, and as a university? Uh, and again, there's, there's a larger issue here that I'm very interested in, which is the role of universities in general, particularly universities that are public and, and uh, are uh, important aspects of how the state organizes uh, education. How how we are going to become part of a larger discussion concerning trust and and, and the use of this technology. But there are also issues of academic integrity. So again, like if we we want students to use this technology, we also don't want them to to just not use at all the old forms of of learning, where you know they have to go to libraries. And I mean, of course, we need to be innovative here. But uh, it's not like academic integrity is not an issue at all, right? So we need to also worry about that. But again, I think it's really important the point uh, Jennifer made at the beginning, which that shouldn't be our main focus. Our main focus should be this more uh, creative approach where we're trying to help the students uh, get a better uh, education without preventing them from using this technology. Right? Uh, so. Lack of access to technology is already a huge issue in the philosophy and the ethics of AI. This is a technology that depends on a, on, on, a, on the internet, which is 50% in English. And of course, there's huge problems here about the global South not being part of the generation of this technology, the bias that is built into the technology. These are all issues that affect our students and that affect the ethics of information and access to information, access to the technology, access to uh, the sources of knowledge production and being represented in that production of knowledge. These are all issues that we should also be focusing on. And as a university, we should worry that our, our uh, very diverse uh, student population is represented in how this technology uh, deploys uh, information and, and, and knowledge in the public. Uh, so again, that's another uh, aspect of how we could become part of this uh, conversation, asking the, the the producers of the technology to create a more uh, diverse version of what they're doing, less biased. I mean, they're, uh, of course, this is already a big issue in in uh, AI ethics, but but uh, within our classrooms and as a university, there's ways in which we could also participate in this conversation. Um, so uh, and also. One thing that is important is that we need to collaborate across different parts of our campus, right? So we, I, I get a lot of information and ideas from my colleagues in the in the ethics of AI, the certificate, uh, the graduate certificate uh, in AI that was initiated uh, uh, a few years ago uh, by Professor uh, Dragutin Pektovic and, and uh, Professor Denise Kleinrichert at the uh, respectively, at the uh, uh, Department of Computer Science and, and the uh, College of Business, and we've been collaborating. We've been thinking about how to 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 create a, a a framework for students to think about these issues in AI from the perspective of the humanities, from the perspective of computer science and 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 the sciences, and from the perspective of business. And it's it's been a great collaboration, but I think our campus can do a lot better promoting this approach and making more efforts to uh, have more collaboration that is supported by the campus and that also is uh, distributed uh, outside the campus, like more promotion and, and uh, publicity about what, what we're already doing and what we want to do. So I think that's also something very valuable about these webinars and I hope uh, we continue 
not only we continue that we continue this conversation, but that our collaboration becomes more uh, substantive and, and and moving into these areas that that I that I've been touching on, and um, and also that our campus is is uh, supportive of this effort. Uh, okay, I think I'm gonna stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Fantastic, thank you. So the Q&A is open. Uh, there's already a few questions um, that we can start asking. Um, so please actually just take a moment to pop your questions in the Q&A if you haven't done so already. Um, and we will start that portion uh, of the webinar. So let's see. Um, I'm gonna start, I think, with this one. This one says, um, from your own experiences and interaction with faculty, what support do you think SF State faculty need to make the changes to their pedagogy and courses so that they're not policing, but actually embracing AI while also, you know, cultivating trust between faculty and students? What, what, would, what would you suggest that we do to help faculty get there? And you, uh, you'll probably have a better answer to this question than I think, Jennifer, but... <laughs> Uh, I, I think uh, this kind of webinar is very good uh, because we we have different experiences in our classroom. We emphasize different things. Uh, I think asking them not as a policy that should be imposed, uh, sort of like uh, from the top, that we need. To, that, I mean, we we have freedom of expression too, right? So, in classroom, so it shouldn't be imposed, but we should be thinking about having. A couple of assignments or one or two experiments where we ask students, okay, ask, you know, we, we read this text or 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 you know how to code this thing. Now ask Jack Chat GPT and criticize it as part of uh the, the uh, class experience so that they perceive that we're not opposed yeah. to their doing this and that we can do this collaboratively. I think that's very important to send that message, even if, if it's something silly and that we don't grade or we don't, you know, uh and having more of that and, and having more exchanges where uh, the assignment is such that even if they use ChatGPT, they would have to be very creative in the first place and that we need to create that atmosphere in class. I think those kinds of things are very important. Mm -hmm. And um, and to do that, so so again, the, the, this shouldn't be policed by the, by, you know, across mm -hmm. campus, but at the same time, it should be a, a, a collective effort. Like mm -hmm. we as a university need to respond in in a, in a less policing way, mm -hmm. and precisely because of what you said, Jennifer, that our students are already at a disadvantage because they don't have all the resources that much bigger universities have with respect to compute power and access to technology. We need to actually empower them yeah. uh, with as much as we can in our uh, by by giving them you know the best access they could have to the technology. So uh, yeah, there's a lot. To say here, but um, yeah, maybe you also have probably. Well, I think I actually have another question that I think relates to this. I think one of the fears that we have as faculty with students has has to do with what might be lost, right, for our students as we move toward a kind of more of an embracing um, pedagogical model. So I'm thinking of um, a scholar on plagiarism who has recently, or in the last year or so, argued that she thinks that technology is not going to harm human creativity, that it won't replace it, that it won't harm it, that that exists regardless of technology. And also she says technology has always been perceived as infringing on our creativity. And, you know, that tends to not be the case, I guess. So I wonder if you agree with that. And if maybe that, if you could talk about how you see it enhancing rather than like harming students' creativity, students' critical thinking. I mean, I think we need to be cautious. I think, I think it is not completely true that, that, uh, Creativity just stays untouched. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the people are striking in Hollywood because because of this, right? And, mm -hmm. and these are not unsophisticated people that are just upset. Right. Uh, they they understand that the technology is being used in a way that it's eroding trust, is uh, part of a bigger uh, schema of, of like making their 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 contribution to the industry. In this case, the movie industry or the, the film industry, uh, less relevant. So I, I think those are very important problems. I mean, 
what happened to to public transportation and specifically to to taxi drivers mm-hmm. with the introduction of Uber. I mean, that's it's a different context, but I think there's very legitimate reasons for people to not to to be worries about the use of this technology. AI generative AI is really interesting because it it has that side of things that that danger is there but it also is part of knowledge production right so it's mm-hmm. it's uh, people mm-hmm. are using it to to generate knowledge and to to right. to uh, um make things easier uh for the research and so on so we want our students to do that we also don't want them to to be unreflective about the risks of the right. technology and i think that's also important as part of our effort to ge- generate trust is to say Look, these technologies have been have not been used in 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 very ethical ways mm-hmm. in the past. They've harmed uh, underrepresented groups. They're being part of uh, the asymmetry we have between the ultra rich and, and the rest of the population. These are pro- the, the the public sphere has suffered from social media. Part of all our, our very sad uh, lack of trust in, in 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 sources that we used to trust, right? Like. And, and, and sort of trusting what is true comes from the use of these technologies in the erosion of the public sphere. So we want them to be reflective about all these things as part of their education. But we also want to balance that with, look, these very bad things may happen and we need to be part of this conversation and so on. But you need to use the technology because other your other peers at other institutions are going to probably use this, this technology. And uh, and we're here to help you use the technology in, a, in, in as, as yeah. beneficial a way as, as is possible. Yeah, it reminds me one of the things that struck me, and actually another colleague who was at our student panel the other week. The students were enthusiastic about AI. They talked about how they, you know, embrace it, use it, how it helps them, how it you know does all these things for them. But my colleague and I both noted that their enthusiasm was framed. In terms of efficiency, like they could do more faster and grades, they could turn things in with confidence, knowing that it was not going to be marked down. We we were missing a framing of AI in terms of their learning, right? So like that, that was missing. And I think that goes to the faculty's fear about what this might do for, you know, might the harm this might cause for students in terms of just taking over some critical aspect of process that is important to deeper learning. So I wonder, you know, how do we do, how do we harness their enthusiasm, you know, which is great, and they're engaged and they're using this stuff, but direct it toward engagement and learning and deeper thinking and maybe critique, and not so much towards like I can get more done and get get to the you know finish line faster. Not that there's anything wrong necessarily with that, but it isn't our goal always as faculty. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think a lot of the enthusiasm comes from from something th- for, yeah it's interesting that it's it's about a, a, like faster results and and and, and more confidence right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think that's that's good that's a good in a starting place I think we should we should say yeah like that's if you that's how you feel then this is good for everyone right but um it would be better if their enthusiasm was also about the university being a good place for them, right? So if the if the enthusiasm is just like this university is like an like I you know it's like a bunch of things, a bunch of obstacles that I need to pass. This is like a highway for me to pass those obstacles. Mm-hmm. That's not what we want, right? Mm-hmm. That's not good enthusiasm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's that's just like bypassing their education through you know, online classes or whatever, and, and, you know, expert systems that are going to give them uh, ways of uh, transitioning through their education in a much faster way. So I think, I mean, they're, they're also very smart, our students, right? So so having these conversations with them is important, right? Like, like of course, that's a, a very attractive aspect of this right. thing. Uh, but we also want you to see that you're here for a reason because we, you know, Collaborating and understanding, there's a deeper kind of knowledge that you need to really appreciate the, the potential of this technology and to really appreciate the, 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 the risks of using it all the time, right? So um, 
that extra value that they, they, they gain in our classrooms is what we need to be emphasizing for them to really be engaged and, and for their enthusiasm to really be productive for yeah. us and for, and for them. Because uh, the way these technologies, again, has, have been used in other areas is, you know, cut more and more and more corners and uh, make everything more optimal. But by doing that, uh, sort of degrading the the, the 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 dignity and the value of the labor of uh, those involved in those uh, industries, of the people involved in those industries. And in the case of education, it would be not only a lack of trust among students and professors, but sort of like this sort of like enthusiasm about like the challenge of I'm going to use this as much as possible to jump as many hoops as fast as as quickly as possible without really reflecting on their education. Yeah. There's a, a really interesting couple of questions here, or I think it's all one question. Let me see. So it says, do you have any concerns from an ethical perspective for what knowledge is becoming as general AI becomes increasingly part of knowledge production? A takeaway from the student panel for me, this person says, is that learning and knowledge do not mean the same things as they did pre-generative AI. So wondering if you see that as well, like pre-internet, knowledge and learning was about knowing things. With the internet, it's about marshalling resources and information toward the problem you're working on. What is it with AI? Is it a conversation with our AI overlords? It's funny. Um, like, what does knowledge look like in this AI world? And it's a great question. I think that's a really very philosophical question, too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, I, I, I mean. I mean, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I actually talk about this in, in the book, but knowledge is something that we value collectively, right? And we produce knowledge through the education system. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be one of the main duties of the state to educate uh, its citizens. So the state is not only like the monopoly of violence and, you know, police. It's that, right? The army. and But it's also, uh, it's supposed to be, the grantor of rights. And one of the rights is to have freedom of expression, freedom of information, have the right to, to get a, a, at least a dignified education, right? So we have education not because we're trying to solve problems optimally. That's, that's one of the ways in which the university system was framed in the US but well, in other industrial nations. But that's not the, the main reason to have an education system. So knowledge production is valuable not because of how we control resources. It, it's valuable in itself. Mm -hmm. And we really need to emphasize that in, uh, as a university. Because otherwise, we just become part of a utilitarian scheme where actually it's fine if corporations become the main source of knowledge production because we are already assuming our role as distributors and sort of knowledge mongers, right? That's, that's not how we should perceive ourselves. We should... I think that's why it's important that the public university, as attacked as it has been attacked in, in, in recent times uh, through all sorts of ways, including budget cuts, that we assert ourselves as the, the I, I, I don't know what word to use, but this is a very romantic book, the guardians of knowledge production yeah. from the public perspective, right? Mm -hmm. We're not we're not just like a corporation that is trying to entertain our students and help them cut corners and, 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 and you know, be the next, uh, sort of like Uberize their lives mm -hmm. so that they can, uh, you know, uh, have an app for everything. We want, we want them to, to, to be uh, dignified, you know, uh, self-respecting, reflective individuals. And that the value of that knowledge, I think, is really intrinsically valuable. Is not valuable because you can do things with it, and the more we emphasize, the uh, the the better. I don't know uh, th that how how that gets emphasized in different disciplines and across campus. It's going to look different, but I think it is very important that we emphasize that. Connected question here um, is a really good one. Also, um, it says Carlos, you started by talking about the impact on other industries. Um, can you talk a bit more about parallels between earlier automation or technology disruptions on other industries and generative AI's possible impact on higher education? Yeah, that's another <clears throat> great question. So uh, 
Actually, I just got an email from from my colleague Dragutin Pektovic, who who keeps me updated, keeps all all of us updated about <laughs> all sorts of really interesting things. And there's a, a recent book about the Luddites, the the movement in England. I saw uh, that, <laughs> and, and it's a really interesting perspective because what the author says is uh, that movement that was con- was interpreted after the Industrial Revolution as uh, almost retrograde. Uh, obsolete, absurd yeah. uh, opposition to technology is really uh, important today because th- their point is there's a choice here, right? So the, the choice is if you use automation as a weapon against labor, against uh, the benefit of, of most of the population, if the result of automation is the production of wealth that gets more and more monopolized. I mean, I was talking to 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 a friend who's who said like if you if you have a startup in 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 Silicon Valley, it doesn't matter how smart you are, you can be the new Alan Turing. It's very likely that one of the big guys is going to buy you, right? Because they have the big compute. So the the effect of automation and the effect of controlling information at a global scale has resulted in the monopolization of wealth and that also, with generative AI, turns into a monopoly of knowledge production, right? So that's super dangerous. Yeah. For education, that's a real threat. And but but there's also the old threat from the Luddites, right? Which is the choice is not between developing technology or not developing technology. The choice is between developing technology that harms a lot of people and displaces their labor and their and reduces or or eliminates their dignity. And use and developing technology that helps people democratically in an open way and 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 in a way that doesn't monopolize wealth and and and, and power, right? So, I think we the world we live in is the second world. <laughs> we have technology that is harming people, displacing people, yes. uh, monopolizing wealth and power, and we need to create a, the, the other alternative. And that's why I thought this 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 uh, comparison with the Luddites. Was was great. I haven't read the book, so I can't completely endorse it. But what I read, which is this thing that the R- Rogutin sent to me, literally like ten minutes before this talk, um, looks really interesting. And I think it's a again something that needs to be part of a broader conversation in, in public education. The harms are very interesting. I mean, you're talking about really big harms, important harms, and I don't want to minimize them by the example that I read from the Luddite book. I haven't read the book either, but I read a review um, when. You know, time used to be a, a qualitative experience. You know, they didn't have standardized clocks and digital clocks, and time was sort of your sense of when the sun went down or your sense of when the livestock were hungry. And people did not like having standardized time imposed upon them. You know, this was a big deal, and you take it so for granted now. So that interested me because I think of it's there's a kind of parallel to generative AI and synthetic language, things that we feel strongly are qualitative human felt lived experience things that maybe are subtle maybe don't matter does it matter if the clock tells you or you just know when it what time it is um but you know it's going to change and there are there are things that we lose in that the you know carlos and i are from lca so i guess we can you know be a little uh nostalgic or something about the humanities and the the humanistic side of things no, um, there's and, another question go ahead no, and we, just just to complement what you're saying it, we need to be humanists about this technology that the humanities are super important the, the the developers of the technology are saying these really paradoxical things like they want to be regulated but they don't really want yeah. to be regulated. the other thing they keep, they keep saying is we need to 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 make this technology humane the human perspective uh knowledge understanding th- those are categories that the humanities really cares about and dignity Human dignity. I mean, one very important about the 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 thing on the Luddites is that <clears throat> I, I love your example about time because I worked on time uh, uh, mm-hmm. for a long time. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, it, it industrialization and the kind of displacement of of human creativity and and, and dignity and has been imposed on us for three hundred years, right? So yeah. it started with time. There's a lot of books about this, right? It started with time. It started with mass transportation. It allows population growth, but it allows uh, accumulation of wealth that was also unprecedented. Mm-hmm. And 
the artisan was displaced by the skilled worker and the skilled, these are the Luddites, right? The skilled worker was d- displaced by cheap labor, pauperized, underpaid labor that depended on very, very efficient machines and, and cheaper products, right? So that has been imposed on us for quite some time, right? Mm-hmm. And if that's the model we're going to follow in generative AI, we're, we're in trouble. So we, mm-hmm. we really need the humanities perspective, but we also need to be, to protect the, the, yeah. the, 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 the places that are legitimately in charge of knowledge production, which is the university. We have only about 10 minutes left. And so I'm going to take us down onto the ground a little bit. I would stay up here. <laughs> you know, I love this conversation. But there's a question in the chat um, that I'm going to maybe paraphrase a little bit. What, what policies will you use in your own classrooms? Um, this is your question in Oshawa paraphrase. Like, what, what will you do with your students this spring? What will you tell them? How will you use it? What ground rules will you set? So I think uh, it's it's different with, I mean, I, I think from my perspective, it's a little bit different uh, between undergraduate students and especially early undergraduate uh, classes and grad students. Like a lot of my grad students just don't, don't even think about just writing a paper through chat GPT, right? So they, they, they value sort of engagement with the text. They, they, they understand that, right. but even with them, it's interesting to, to find some, ways of using the technology. I haven't really thought of doing that uh, very systematically with grad students, but I think the grad student population is different. But um, even there, I think one of the policies could be ask, you know, uh, ask one of your peers a question about this issue in ethics or whatever, and then ask ChatGPT or read this philosopher, read the ChatGPT version of what the philosopher would say and try to find mismatches, just errors, basic errors, basic misunderstandings. That kind of thing is very valuable. And then for undergrads, I think what is really interesting, wh- what would be interesting, I'm trying, I'm going to try to do that, is you can ask GPT to tell you what a philosoph- philosophical problem is about. Right? Mm-hmm. So you can ask GPT, what is the problem of free will? And then GPT gives you a... I, I think you mentioned this, Jennifer. I love that, that it sounds like a... Like a uh, um, like the kind of thing that you hear at airplanes when you board the plane. Yes, a flight attendant. A flight attendant. The elevated language. So, so you get a flight attendant version of what's what's the problem of free free will, and um, and then to ask them, well, think about what, how accurate that is, but not only not only how accurate it's, it's going to be slightly accurate or very accurate, right? How deep the understanding is. Is there something? about what is the most important salient issue about free will, or is it just a jumble of accurate but not well understood ideas? And mm-hmm. so, so giving this kind of difference that is related to the previous question between utilizing sources and then optimizing and uberizing everything, and no, 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 there's, there's something deep about this problem, right? And, and I want you to see, like, how what GPT says differs from what this philosopher says, right? Where do you see the difference in depth, the difference in how the problem is taken in? Mm-hmm. Will you let them use it to write their papers? Like I don't know. <laughs> it's fine for brainstorming or editing, but not content generate. I mean, I, I mean, I'm planning to tell them that I'm not going to police them. That's mm-hmm. for sure. I'm not, I'm going to say what you should be doing is for the assignments, follow the assignments, you know, compare. When you produce your paper, I'm not going to police it. I'm not going to uh, accuse you of plagiarism if I somehow see that you use it, but just be thoughtful. And of course, I'm going to try to design uh, paper assignments where it's going to be kind of hard for them to simply use GPT because mm-hmm. you can ask them, for example, to compare two very specific things about the readings with an example from class. Mm-hmm. GPT is going to be like what which class like mm-hmm. yeah yeah so here's a related question like how do we have ethical conversations with our students about ai such as open ai's use of cheap labor to create llms it's a great question i mean students need to know and i think our students are very uh sensitive to and very good at analyzing those labor questions you know mm-hmm. folks out there in other countries who are paid you know um to do the content moderation or whatever it is labeling 
so what ethical concerns do you think are important to discuss with students? Yeah, this is super impor important. I mean, they're called farms and, 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 and mm -hmm. uh, sweatshops because they're really terrible. They, they're, they're, they're used for labeling and, and giving feedback to the LLMs. And, uh, that shows you that, that there's nothing rosy about the, I mean, the technology is part of the, of the, of the industrialization, uh, unethical consequences of, of, uh, displacing labor and, and so on. But, um, that's why I think, although we shouldn't be policing our students, uh, I mean, that's, that's something very important about this question. We shouldn't be cheerleaders of the technology, right? We shouldn't, we should be critical and mm -hmm. we should ref be reflective. And again, that's going to look different department by department, uh, college by college. But as a campus, we should be trying to create an effort of saying that we shouldn't be cheerleaders. There's a lot of bad things about this technology. There's a, a book called The Atlas of AI that I, I talk a little bit about that in my book, uh, where the author Kate uh, Crawford says, you know, there's massive environmental harm. They consume more energy than the entire uh, plane industry. They uh, use very cheap labor. That they, they could they, they could avoid doing that, but they're using that because they're cutting cor corners. They're ultra competitive among themselves. The data is biased. Uh, it is mostly from uh, uh, data that 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 has racial bias, socioeconomic bias, language bias. There's all sorts of problems. So we do need to be reflective and maybe eventually even choose a couple of texts or samples of text where we tell our students, look, uh, you, you, we're not going to police you. You should be able to use the technology. But here are a few things that you should know about this technology, right? Just how it's already being used and how it's already harming people and, and creating more uh, disparity and polarization. Yeah. There's one more question here about the tensions uh, between ethical perspectives and theories that may apply in workplace ethics. So human resources, product development, how do we navigate those tensions? It's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting question because uh, that has to do with campus support, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if if the campus perceives that supporting our students is not talking to the faculty and then just giving students, I don't know what, more computers or because they are, I mean, so that's, if that's the understanding, we need to have a conversation, right? So by, by support, I, I mean like an in, sort of like a more integral support where, yeah, there has to be a component in HR and training of the faculty. And, and more support about for research in this area, but in general, also more support for efforts where we're trying to collaborate with students. Uh, and that should involve, again, issues in uh, IT, but uh, how HR sees the, the, the support they give us by helping our students use this technology. So uh, I completely agree that those are different uh, cultures. And I don't have a very good solution of how to do that other than even there, we shouldn't be just cheerleading the technology and decisions should be part of a dialogue, right? If the campus just decides something without consulting the faculty, I think that's 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 going to be problematic. Yeah. And also if, if we just decide to ignore the issue, that's also going to be problematic. Yeah, yeah. We need to be in community with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to wrap us up. I think we are about out of time. A uh, huge thank you to Carlos. No, uh, thank you, Jennifer. And that yeah. a lot of these yeah. ideas are Jennifer's, actually. So that's not true. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, Robin, Noshua, Jeremy, uh, Jessica, all the folks who make all of this happen. It's really uh, been very great to collaborate with you on all of this. Uh, and thank you, all the participants. Great questions. Uh, this will be posted, so you'll have access to it eventually. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you.